Here we go. All right, so friendly reminder, tomorrow we're doing a map. You have no quiz or anything tomorrow. Monday we have no school. Uh, Tuesday you have vocab 1 through 10, Wednesday 11 through 20. Your map and primary are due on Wednesday. And Thursday you have a test and you have focus and spice are due on Thursday. Doesn't it sound good to be back? Perfect. All right, here we go. On the top of your notes, you're going to write period 5, which is 1750 to 1900. I can't believe we're in 5. Isn't that crazy? So period 5, which is 1750 to 1900. Today is obviously week 20, so you should have that in your notes just to keep track. And then you need to have enlightenment. That's the first topic we are covering today. So the enlightenment. The Enlightenment is going to challenge divine right. The Enlightenment challenges divine right. First of all, what is divine right? We've talked about 10,000 times, people. What do you got? The monarchs are chosen by God. Yes. Have yeah, for instance, it's a great way to get away with anything you want. God chose me to rule. Who are you to challenge God's authority? It's a perfect way to get away with whatever the hell you want. So that's divine right. So... The Enlightenment is going to challenge divine right with a new idea called popular sovereignty. And you're going to write that down. With a new idea called popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty is the belief that the people hold the power. Popular sovereignty is the belief that the people hold the power and allow themselves to be governed. That popular sovereignty is the belief that the people hold the power and they allow themselves to be governed. Okay, so consent of the governed, have you heard that expression? Yes, hopefully you have. It's in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. Okay, so what popular sovereignty is, it is saying that kings do not have the right to rule any way they want. The people allow them to rule in that way. So if we allow people to rule, what can we also do? overthrow them so it justifies the overthrowing of government so which is really interesting so you need to know of a dude named John Locke who happens to be my favorite enlightenment thinker also quite the stud I'm just going to say very handsome man some portraits okay so John not much as Thomas Paine Thomas Paine was a looker damn he was so cute yeah it's real bad it's back. alright so John Locke you need to know you need to know his book okay it's right there for you um, congrats, welcome to period five. Every guy's got a book. Some of them I'll tell you you need to know, some of them I don't care about. But you do need to know John Locke's book. Um, what's up? Why, wait, why is he in period four, though? Because he's in period four because the Enlightenment lays the foundation for the revolutions, and it makes sense to show the connection. Okay. So, you need to know that John Locke is going to create popular sovereignty. He is the brains behind popular sovereignty. You need to know that he came up and coined the term consent of the rule, which is popular sovereignty. And you need to know that he believes in life, liberty, and property. Property. I led you astray. I led you astray. Okay. It's Thomas Jefferson, he was like, man, I think the pursuit of happiness would be better than property, so he kind of changed it. But it is John Locke who believes in individual rights. Ladies and gentlemen, why do we have amendments to our Constitution? They provide us individual rights. Yes. Okay. So John Locke is all over our Declaration of Independence, right? The Declaration of Independence includes life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Locke talks about the consent of the rule. John Locke, and in our declare in our Constitution, we have individual rights. There you go. Okay. You need to know Voltaire. Don't worry about his real name because I don't even know it. And you definitely don't need to know his book because it's in French. Who cares? Uh, so, Voltaire, you need to know his freedom of speech. That's all you need to know about him. Write down Voltaire and write down freedom of speech. Now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he's a very big deal. Okay, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he believes in equality in, uh, before the law. Equality before the law. Is that a fundamental American policy? Hello? Hello? Have we heard of this before? We're all equal in front of the law. Blind justice. You know, the, the yeah. chick outside the courthouse is blind. Only yeah. on the scales of justice, yeah. Yeah. That would be Jean Jacques Rousseau, so kind of a big deal. 
Okay? He wrote the social contract, which is what you need to know. That's his book. You need to know that one. Okay? That he says that society decides the governing. And we allow governors to rule. So he builds off of what? John Locke said. Okay? So hopefully you see the fingerprints of these gentlemen are all over our government, which is pretty cool. All right, here we go. You don't need to write it out. Write down American Revolution. That's your new title. <clears throat> uh, if you want to include 1776 to 1783, that's your date range for the American Revolution. Except fighting starts in 1781, but the treaty isn't signed until 83, so we don't officially get our independence until 83. So you need to know that the British, that American colonists called themselves British. Okay. American colonists called themselves British. Now, one reason, what makes Britain really special at this point, it happened in 1215. There's plenty of kings and stuff, but Britain is super special because of an incident that happened in 1215. So, yeah? It is the Magna Carta, and you should write that down. The Magna Carta, signed in 1215, created British Parliament which we hear, obviously, we saw on Tuesday, is still going, as they voted down Theresa May. Shit, what a mess. Um, the, it creates the British Parliament and puts checks on the king. Okay, it takes away power from the king. What do you got? Yeah. Oh, Hold this one. Is it the, uh, The oldest, um, you're talking about the Constitution, is the yeah. oldest working document. Why is the Magna Carta? The Magna Carta is just the creation of it. It's like the Declaration of Independence is the creation of the United States as the starting point, but there's no actual, like we amend the Constitution. Like we have what, 26, 27 now, 28, something like that? Sorry, I don't teach a push. Um, but that being said, we're constantly working on that one. The Declaration of Independence is perfect. Right? Like, we don't add to it. We don't change anything. It's the best breakup letter in the history of the world. Right? The Magna Carta, no one's adding to that. It just creates something new. That's why. It's a good question, Colton. All right. So, you need to know that the Magna Carta was created. It allows, uh, creates that British people are no longer being taxed by the king, but taxed by parliament. And parliament's made up of people. No taxation without representation. Have we heard that chant before? It's a British chant. Because you can't tax the British people unless they have representation in Parliament. Parliament decides who taxes. Okay, you need to know that the Americas are very important to the British uh, Empire. The British are the only ones allowed to trade with the Americas. So the Americas are guaranteed purchasers of all British goods. So the British make goods, sell it to the Americans, and it keeps this really nice, strong economy going. Does that make sense? So they depend on them economically. They also depend on the Americas militarily because with the Americas, they are then launching attacks against the French and the Spanish in the Caribbean and trying to take over more territory there. So it's a big deal there. Okay, French and Indian War. All right, I'm going to move quick. Here we go. French and Indian War, which is, that, which is part of what larger war, ladies and gentlemen? First large war, uh, world war ever, Philip. Seven years war. Seven Years War is fought in three theaters here in the United States, French and Indian War. In Europe, they're just straight up killing each other in Europe, and they're fighting each other in the Dutch East Indies. Who was fighting in the Seven Years War? One of the two teams. Come on, guys. Nathan? No. No. In the Seven Years War? The big one? No. Hey? Oh, uh, the British... Uh, the East, East India. India Company and the Dutch East India Company. There you go. EOC versus the e, uh, EOC versus VOC, right? And then who who joins the Dutch side? The French, and that's how we get the French. Why did the French join the Dutch? Why, Cynthia? They hate the British, as we're going to continue seeing. They're going to just want to kill British people. So here in the Americas, we have the French and Indian War. You were not allowed to cross the Appalachian Mountains if you were a colonist. On the other side of the Appalachian is all of the Native Americans and the French. Why do Why do natives love the French? Why? What type of What makes them love the French way more than they love the British? Come on, people. This is period four content. Let's go. Why? Someone other than uh, Cynthia, Nate. Yeah, the French. 
French works with them. Remember, they're fur trappers, so they depended on their knowledge and they blended their families together, yes? Okay? The British are like, oh, sign a contract. You come back, I kill you. Guess who's going to come back because they don't understand what the sign. The natives, okay? So, French and Indian War, very, very expensive. So, because it's so expensive, they are going to increase taxes on the colonists. So, keep in mind, American colonists are paying 11% tax. We pay 7% sales tax here, so 11% is pretty big. Okay? And now all of a sudden they want us to pay 15%. So Americans just go wild saying, oh my God, no, absolutely not. Now some of the taxes, and you should write down two of them, um, are up there. Now, please keep in mind, the British are saying, from the British perspective, the British have just sent troops to the Americas to defend these colonists' home, and now those colonists, whose home I literally defended, don't want to pay more taxes like, what the hell? I just defended their home. Now, keep in mind, British citizens also on the island of Britain pay 30% taxes. So when you hear 11% taxes, now or 15% taxes, and you are a British citizen working in a factory paying 30%, how much sympathy do you have? Zero sympathy. So you're like, what the hell? These, these cats are a bunch of whiners, which is why British people think all we do is complain as Americans. And this is the fundamental reason why. So... What they do, we have the tax burden. We have the first one is the Sugar Act, second one is Stamp Act. Stamp Act is all government documents, and any printed materials is the Stamp Act. Then you have the Quartering Act, so it's the housing of British troops. They used to put troops living in your house because A, it was more affordable, and B, they could spy on the populations, especially as things were starting to get tough. Okay? How did Americans feel about this? We hated it. We hated it so much, we made it uh, Amendment 4. Banning it from ever happening here in the United States. That's how much our founding fathers hated it. So they made it amendment number four. Then we, of course, have the Tea Act. And the Tea Act leads directly to what? You're welcome. My ancestors were on the boat. Thank you. We're very proud. Um, and there you go. So, Declaration of Independence. So, Declaration of Independence was written and signed by the Continental Congress. Now, Continental Congress was signed was created in 1774. Continental Congress was completely illegal. After the Boston Tea Party, no large congregations were allowed to meet without approval by the British government. So what would happen is the Continental Congress would move to different locations, secret locations, in churches uh, throughout New England so they could meet. Now, for the first two year, first year, they really all only did was fight with each other because keep in mind the 13 colonies really did not trust each other. They did not like each other, and they saw each other as competition. What a great foundation for creating a new nation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Declaration of Independence is going to declare war on the most powerful nation that the world has ever seen. It has the largest navy the world's ever seen. It has the largest standing army at the, in the world at that time. It is also the most technologically advanced nation in the world. It also has a secure government supporting it. Did we have that here in the United States? Hell no, our government was a hot mess. It was a terrible decision to declare war against, the great, against England. Can we agree? It was... So it should have, it should have been the biggest disaster in the history of the world. Now, thank God it didn't. Hell yes. Here we are. Let freedom ring. Correct? I'm a huge American patriot, but it was the dumbest thing a bunch of farmers could have done standing in a church saying, ah, let's do this. It's like today, the country of Kenya declaring war against the United States. How long do you think Kenya's going to fare? It's going to be terrible. They're going to get blown off the planet real quick. That's the same type of comparison. There was just no amount of way. Now, a bunch of things worked out our way. A lot of really sneaky things that George Washington did. Brilliant man. If we didn't have him, we would have definitely lost. Um, and a lot of things happened to fall our way. And thank God the French hate the British. I mean, that's what we really depended on in the crutch time. So thank God for that. So, 1776. The Declaration of Independence was signed and declared. It was written by Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe. It was proofread by Ben Franklin. Okay, so, document. Now, if you've ever seen the Declaration of Independence, whether in per anyone here seen it in person? I have, it's pretty cool. Um, if you've ever seen it in person, you've always seen the steam replicas of it. Uh, everyone except John Hancock, Hancock, his teeny tiny little handwriting, why? <coughs> 
The moment they signed that document was the moment they knew the British were trying to kill them all because they just committed treason against England, and they knew they were going to die, so they all write super scratchy and really shitty, except for your boy, John Hancock, who is just like, hell yeah, screw you, England. The reason why John Hancock hated Britain so damn much is because John Hancock was hustling illegal goods from Canada to the United States, breaking the code of only British goods. So he kept getting caught and kept having to forfeit all of his goods. So he hated the British for that one purpose. The only reason he wanted to fight and declare war is so he could have more free trade <laughs> for his own personal gain, by the way. Anyways, so yeah, it sounds pretty cool. The founding fathers were flawed and unique and awesome in their own unique way. So obviously we got a bunch of luck. Now, you need to know that about 75 to 80% of all Americans were patriots. 20%, 15 to 25, uh, 20% are going to be known as loyalists or Tories. Okay? Now, with the Patriots, okay, um, we're going to see that it's going to help them. Uh, uh, actually, never mind that point. I was going to say something, but I don't want to get down on that. Native Americans are going to favor um, your British, actually, which is really unique, while your African Americans are going to favor the Patriots. Okay, so, well, your slaves are going to favor the Patriots. Of course, both sides were dangling. If we win, you'll get your independence, of course. And, of course, the natives, they said, if we win, we'll give you your own land. How well did that go? No. Not well. Andrew Jackson, who's what, number 11 or 14 for president? Good God. Here we go. All right, so the Revolutionary War, you do need to write down this little chart. Okay, both sides. So... The pros and cons, the strengths of each side. You need to know that the only, the, America won by luck, okay? And by the genius of George Washington, which we'll get into in a second, okay? It was complete fluke, ladies and gentlemen. Do you think Americans who were farming in their fields could literally go ahead and stand against the largest standing military in history? How well do you think that's going to go? Do you know how when we think about Iraq and Afghanistan and how we hate how ISIS hides, uh, hides in buildings and stuff like that and we have to go out and clear them, how that's very dangerous for our troops? I guess you started that type of guerrilla warfare. We did. Why? Because we couldn't defeat them on the battlefield. So what we did is we would shoot them on their way to the battlefield. We would stand behind trees and along roads and we would shoot them as they were moving through on the territory. So that was the only way we could fight with them because an open battle, of course, we would lose because we didn't have the discipline. So, colonies, logistic advantage. We knew all the back roads. Okay, we know the British are coming down this road. We know how to get around them faster. Okay, also popular support. Everywhere we went, people were cheering us on. Everywhere the British went, what was happening to them? They were getting jeered, they were getting scowled, people didn't want to associate with them. Uh, we also had the French. French is the reason why we won Yorktown, okay? And, of course, George Washington. Now, George Washington, obviously, today has a ton of folklore and all that stuff about him, and he's a pretty incredible guy. The reason why he's such an incredible guy is for a couple of reasons. A, he looks like a leader. He's like 6'6". He's an attractive man for the time. I mean, when I look at George Washington now, I'm like, whew, let's see me. But um, he was a very attractive man for the time, tall, slender. He was also incredibly well-educated and well-spoken. So when other kings heard about this guy who's incredibly well-spoken, very intelligent, it made them feel better of helping the cause. Does that make sense? And then finally, he knew he couldn't win on a traditional battlefield. So my man set up spy rings throughout all of America. The reason why we won is because of spy rings and non-traditional military techniques. Like, perfect example, Valley Forge. Okay, in the middle, um, we happen to leave a cart full of whiskey abandoned near a Hessian mercenary camp. I can't believe the government just, you know, the American army just left it behind how precarious. So the German mercenaries found a, a huge cart full of whiskey. So what do you think they do, did on Christmas Eve with it? They drank it. 
So, what did George Washington do and 20 of his closest friends? They snuck into the camp after, like, 3 in the morning when they were all drunk, sleeping, and they cut their throats. They took out about 190 men that night. That is how we won the war, ladies and gentlemen, is doing shady shit like that. Because in open battle, who is going to win every time? The British. They have the techniques. They have the training. They have the structures. They had the weapons. We didn't have those types of skills in order to fight them in open battle, so we had to do the shady shit. And the shady shit is cool as hell. I'm not going to lie. Getting a bunch of Hessians drunk and then murdering them in their beds on Christmas Day. It's a classic. I don't care who you are. That's pretty awesome. So, now the British, of course, they're the most powerful government in the world. They also can pay their soldiers. And that is a huge thing. Funny that I'm talking about it in the longest government shutdown in American history. They can also pay their soldiers. Okay? Do you think Americans fighting for uh, America were getting paid? No, there was no government. There was no currency, ladies and gentlemen. They printed some shit, but it meant nothing. Okay? They weren't getting paid. Now, in 17... 84, no, 1785, we have a thing called Shays' Rebellion, which you're going to learn way more about in a push next year, where former revolutionary veterans overthrew the government and with, could have taken over and completely crashed the government in 1783, and the whole thing could have ended. George Washington, reluctantly, but eventually gave the go-ahead, saved our government by telling the U.S. The US military to kill about 1,200 Americans. They were trying to overthrow the government because the government couldn't pay them for paying for fighting in the war. They were tired of hearing that they're gonna, 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 so they started a revolution. They were trying to overthrow. Uh, George Washington gave the command to uh, kill anyone who challenged their authority, and 1,200 Americans died for that. So paying your soldiers, this isn't important. Is it a motivating factor? Yes. Okay, so... Building an independent state. You need to know by 1780, uh, 1781, the war ends. This is an abbreviated, and I'm puzzling, and this makes me so sad. So sad. 1781, the world ends. Uh, the, the world ends. The world does not end in 1781. The war ends in 1781 at the Battle of Yorktown. At the Battle of Yorktown, George Washington gets some insight, finding out that Lord Cornwallis is on the move. They shift him, and they trap him in a cove. Before Lord Cornwallis could escape out that cove, out of Yorktown, and into the bay, and could have parked pretty much anywhere else, because all Washington gambled everything on this one maneuver, and if it didn't work, oh shit, we were screwed. Anyway, it did work because the British showed up, uh, the French showed up and clogged the harbor, so the British couldn't leave, and then Lord Cornwallis, who was the general overseeing the whole conflict here in the Americas, had to surrender. So, thank you, British, okay? We would have definitely lost. If Lord Cornwallis got out, huh? The French blocked the cove, so the British had to surrender to us. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the war officially, the war ends in 1781 of actually fighting, but the war doesn't officially end until 1783 with the ratification of the Peace of Paris. And you need to have that down, you need to know that. The Peace of Paris is going to officially recognize that Britain is no longer in control of the Americans. Now, a funny thing is, just giving you a little indication, in the Peace of Paris, we said that we wouldn't do this, 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 and this, and we would pay this, this, and this. Guess what we didn't do? Any of those things! We didn't pay them back, and we just kept fishing wherever we wanted to fish, and eventually this is going to lead directly into the War of 1812, when the British reinvade us, because we didn't fulfill the requirements of the Treaty of uh, Peace of Paris, and the War of 1812 is considered uh, part two of the American Revolution. Fun fact, we'll get to it. Okay, so... Now, you do need to know that in 1787, the U.S. Constitution is dra drafted, ratified, and passed. Now, between 1781 to 1787, we have the Articles of Confederation. Failed epically. You know, I told you how the states didn't like each other, the 13 original colonies, they didn't like each other. That document literally embraced all the things they hated. Uh, about each other, and it literally caused them to fight and want to break up, and eventually, of course, Shays Rebellion exposed everything, and the whole government almost collapsed. Then we came up with the Constitution. How's that working out for us? Pretty damn great. Okay, except, well, you know, once again, it's kind of funny I'm saying it during this, but the U.S. Constitution is drafted in 1787. All right. That was like nine minutes 
of four years of education. I hope you enjoyed it. For the boards. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the day range of the American uh, Revolution? Read your damn signs, people. Good. Good. Bella. 1776. There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me what document was written in 1215. Good. What is it, uh, Rod? On your whiteboard, what document is signed in 1776? Oh, God, people. I will call your parents and let them know they did a terrible job raising you. Come on, man. It's one of my favorite holidays. It's my second favorite holiday. Good. What is it, Bobby? Yeah. Tell me you were pausing and hesitating. Damn, you people. It's a celebration of hot dogs and hamburgers. Your white board, please tell me. What is the name of the gentleman who believes in freedom of speech? No. Got a lot of wrong answers there. Who is it, Philip? Voltaire. What is the name of the dude behind popular sovereignty? And who believes in individual rights? Good, Sophia. John Locke. On your white board, please tell me. What is uh, the name of the document signed in 1783. Good. What is it, Josh? Peace of Paris. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What document was signed in 1787? You better know that date because you are American. Good. What is it, William? U.S. Constitution. U.S. Constitution. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of uh, the gentleman who is going to lead to American success during the American Revolution without him being what we would have lost. For sure. Oh, sure. <clears throat> Good. Who is it? Bella. George Washington. George Washington. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the gentleman who believes... I can't remember what he did. Oh, equality before the law. Good. Good. Who is it, Colton? Rousseau. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Uh, I think that's good. All right, I wanted to get French. Here we go. Okay, you're heading out. It's French Revolution. So, the American Revolution is going to start a domino effect. Okay? Keep in mind, I hope you understand that Americans should not have won this war. Literally, things just worked out in tricky ways. George Washington is a tricky, tricky, tricky man. Okay? And because of that, it's going to start this whole thing, that a small group of determined people can have huge changes on the world, and that's what's going to happen. So, we're in the age of revolutions, okay? So we're going to see that people are going to now understand kings even in England and France and Germany and all these places are going to see popular sovereignty is a big deal. These alignment deals are now going to become even bigger because here we are. America, have you ever heard the, exam uh, the nickname of the Great Experiment? Hopefully, yes. Okay, we're called the Great Experiment because we took all these alignment ideals and we shoved them together and we said, work. Okay, so now other places are going to start seeing that. So, the French Revolution. Before we start, listen to me carefully because this is always a point of contention. The American Revolution is it starts with the Declaration of Independence and then it closes with the Constitution. Straightforward, yes? You need to understand that the French Revolution breaks into three parts. The actual, uh, do you want to do it right now? Fine, let's do it. Okay? There are three parts. Can you screw your desk over a little bit? Okay, so the French Revolution is broken up into three parts. Okay, your first one is what you actually think of as the French Revolution. Okay, the French Revolution, okay, is the, the Bastille, false, okay, king, Louis, 
16, assassinated. Okay? That is your fundamental. Then you have a second stage, okay? The second stage is um, the age of terror. Reign of terror. Reign of terror. It's the reign of terror. And it is led by Maximilian, which is an amazing thing. Maximilian first here. Okay? And this is this is when you start executing <coughs> Would you definitely not like to be alive at? Oh yeah. This is not the time to be alive. And then what is my third part of the French Revolution? Dun da da da! He comes in on a little horse. Napoleon. Napoleon. Yes! It's not really a little horse. He was advertised, but it's funny to say it that way. Napoleon. Okay. Yeah. Napoleon Bonaparte is the third. Rises, falls, vanish, okay. and then he, he arrives back. <laughs> this man, this man, arrives back on a day. So that is just a brief little ta-da. Now we're going to go into more detail. So when we talk about the French Revolution, it's in three components. The actual French Revolution where they're like in the streets. Have you ever seen that god-awful movie of Les Mis? Oh, my God. Death. If you ever watch that super crappy movie, I am not suggesting you watch it. They sing everything. It is nonstop singing. What do you want for breakfast? I'd like some Cheerios. Like, oh my God, it makes you want to punch yourself in the face. It's god awful. But it is about the French Revolution. Uh, the first part. They, skip, they cut it off after the first part. Okay, so here we go. The French Revolution, the first. So the causes of the French is what I would write. The cause of the French Revolution is we have serious war debts. Why would France have war debts? Why, William? They spend money on helping America. Yes! <laughs> they sent millions and millions of dollars worth of guns and ammunition to us. Oh, and then they sent their navy to us. Oh, and then they sent troops to us. Why did they do this, Nathan? Slavery. Yeah, they did it. Could you imagine being that petty? Like, I hate you so much, I'm going to bankrupt my country. Oh, the same king who bankrupt his country to kill British people is going to get his head chopped off. So maybe it's poetic justice, who knows. Goodbye! Did we, do we like this stuff? Yeah. Oh, your enthusiasm is off the chart. I hate you. Huh? How were the naval officers? Oh my god, I would assume completely devastating. When they teach the American 